tweaked a bit the presentation today. So the last part, these current and future challenges, I made very short in the very end. And yeah, we can also discuss them in the uh, panel discussion. So focused more to show a bit uh, the different streams we have been um, using uh, to, to do pulmonary imaging at Tomcat, maybe just the side note. So I am a inland scientist at Tomcat, and we are currently also involved in building up a new beamline. So we have two imaging beamlines, uh, which will be a bit complementary, but um, yeah, we can also discuss later. I don't have that actually uh, in this presentation. So I'll briefly touch uh, like the methods and instrument instrumentation that we've been developing and then show some results on in vivo imaging and some fixed samples, which were also in collaboration with uh, uh, some of the people here. Um, yeah, and the outlook and challenges very shortly. Um, yeah, I guess I will make this short as well because most of you are familiar um, with why we actually do uh, lung imaging or why we're interested in lungs. So it's a very important organ. It's uh, one of the leading causes of uh, death and uh, let's say um, morbidity worldwide. And the problems are that uh, the diagnosis is really already at the progressed state when uh, a lung, when there is a, let's say, lung disease developing. And it would, of course, be good to um, have a very early, let's say, screening or uh, identification of a disease or a complication. And so, um, as uh, Lars was showing, there are many different um, clinical, preclinical <coughs> imaging modalities available. But um, I try to, let's say, um, underline what is the main goal, uh, of course, is to have a higher resolution, higher sensitivity in any, um, let's say, imaging modality. So um, this was already shown a bit today. So there are different uh, uh, clinical diagnostics and imaging techniques. The gold standard is HRCT. Uh, also, what's been done now or in the recent past is to develop a bit uh, computer-aided diagnosis and go the route of artificial intelligence. There are preclinical animal models and imaging uh, techniques, which, uh, were kind of, which are kind of established. So there are 2D imaging in vivo 3D, uh, also on fixed samples, and somehow um, our part, which uh, was um, initially developed during my PhD, but also the follow-up uh, uh, project was to, to uh, develop, let's say, in vivo imaging at the micrometer scale. <clears throat> the setup is um, summarized here briefly. So uh, we imaged uh, um, small rats, seven to 14 days old and adult mice. So these are somehow the uh, sample sizes that we can cover, uh, post-mortem and in vivo. Uh, the pixel sizes we used and um, are between one and three micrometers, um, also uh, corresponding to very small field of use. Um, and the uh, acquisition times are here between 300, 400 uh, projections and total scan times of uh, one to two minutes. And um, I will show it later, but basically this is given by the, by the heart rate. So in fact, the um, since we have to take an image triggered with the heartbeat, uh, this makes the scan time much longer. But uh, if you just sum up the extra exposure, it's below a second, actually. Um, this is somehow the end station that we've been uh, developing. I just show here different parts of it. So we have small animal ventilator, ECG, uh, all connected with the detector and the rotation axis system. Uh, isofluorine flow to keep the animal anesthetized and uh, stable. And um, basically, this is how the imaging uh, in the end uh, looks like. And as Martin was already showing, it's very, I really skipped this because uh, it's been already shown. One of the main advantages we utilize at the synchrotron is to have uh, better contrast from uh, uh, face contrast imaging. And in fact, we are not so much interested in, let's say, improving the contrast as much as we are actually interested in reducing the dose. So having high resolution at a very uh, low dose, but low dose, you will see it's quite relative when we are speaking at uh, um, the synchrotron level. So this is, these are the type of images that uh, we were getting with this uh, technique. And as I was mentioning before, the, the challenge was uh, really to um, uh, record the heartbeat to evaluate at what um, time of the heartbeat it's most favorable to take images and to have a follow-up, let's say, uh, acquisition cascade where the shutter opens, where we 
expose the animal to x-rays and go for the next uh, rotation. Um, um, and basically the results that we get is that the lowest achievable dose was in, in the range of five to 10 gray per tomographic scan for this small region of the lung that we were scanning. Um, at the very high photon flux, which is of course available at the synchrotron. Total exposure time, as I said, was below uh, a second, but the whole, let's say, uh, scan took like two minutes. The achievable resolution, which means um, the features that we are eventually seeing in the lung are in this size, but the pixel sizes, as I was showing, are roughly below uh, uh, three micrometers. And uh, of course, this all was uh, part of an acute experiment where we had no immediate effects from the radiation dose, but um, uh, of course, the dose is very high. And uh, recently, or not so recently, but uh, a few years ago, um, we have installed a new microscope, the Tomcat. So this lowest achievable dose, I would claim we can go below one gray, actually, and keep this uh, uh, experimental settings the same. So, and I expect also that we will be able to further push this uh, in the future. <clears throat> yes, so I brief, I didn't show these images. Um, maybe, yeah, uh, uh, this again, just to um, underline that this is uh, in vivo image at different uh, pressures, for instance. So, um, but yeah, I'll actually, I want to show this, which is, which shows some of the challenge. So this is um, a live uh, animal, which we put in the X-ray beam. And there is a, a constant uh, pressure set in the lung. And the, the big movement that you saw, that's actually when the lung is breathing. And so the challenge is that at this resolution, we get motionless images in a tomographic setting and to be able to reconstruct it. Because otherwise, you get something like on the left side, and that's not useful at all. And um, yeah, so basically, uh, the, in order to be able to have this type of imaging, it took us a couple of years or many years, so to say. But um, um, what we also uh, evaluated in all different directions was that once you set, let's say, a constant pressure in the lung, you really have pressure oscillations in the lung uh, from the heartbeat. And uh, you need to trigger very precisely. But what you see also that there are really time points in the heartbeat where the motion in the lung is um, very small. So actually it is feasible and it is possible to do this type of imaging. It just needs to be done in, a, um, in this way. So that's what I was talking about till now was mostly the technique that we were developing uh, during my PhD. But uh, the idea why we wanted to develop this technique was to also apply it to some uh, disease models and, uh, um, and yeah, uh, applications coming from the biomedical uh, or clinical community. So one uh, of the collaborations we had uh, a group in Uppsala and uh, with a group in Grenoble with Sam Bayot, who was mentioning before, was to study uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And um, yeah, that's a very, let's say, serious condition, which, which is triggered by um, different complications that can occur. And the biggest problem is essentially when a patient, for instance, gets uh, administered in the ICU, uh, the mortality rate is actually very high. And then it's a very expensive treatment, of course. And um, one of the main points there is that, um, well, the patient needs to be kept uh, in a st um, stable way but um, needs to be ventilated, but also the ventilator treatment is a further injuring the lung. And the question is always how to tune it. And this is just the statistics I took actually from the Austrian uh, TV not so long time ago. It just showed a bit that, uh, yeah, worldwide, the um, a top one disease is cardiovascular or are cardiovascular diseases. But during COVID, um, it was really uh, significant that uh, complications coming from ARDS, pneumonia, and so on were uh, significant, which was uh, visible in the national uh, statistics. So that, that said, essentially, uh, understanding ventilator treatment and improving it, it's uh, quite uh, significant, so to say. Um, so what we developed here and what we studied here was actually a mouse animal model where we used uh, some sort of aggressive ventilation technique to, to induce in the mouse model um, uh, ventilator-induced lung injury, which is a very similar, um, how to say, uh, um, condition as uh, present in ARDS. And um, the 
the imaging technique was somehow, um, let's say, adapted to this problem, but it's based on what I was showing before. So we had um, the, we set um, a, po a positive and expiratory pressure, and we var varied that one and looked also how the lungs are, um, let's say, um, uh, how the air is being recruited or not into small airways and uh, alveoli. But what what we could actually resolve was um, that from the onset or at the baseline, how actually the lungs look like when uh, such a condition is present. And uh, we could follow up the animal with, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, um, different uh, testing and uh, blood tests and so on. Uh, so just to mimic uh, these, these conditions. Um, yeah, the other thing was also to visualize at which uh, positions in the lung there was a lack of aeration or over distension of the lung. So um, that's so I have to admit here that the experiments there already it's been a while that we took them. We are still analyzing the data, finalizing the paper, and so on. The current hypothesis is really that due to this over distension, which is very heterogeneous. Um, there is a, some sort of self-acceleration uh, taking place when this animal uh, is being ventilated. And um, yeah, um, one of the challenges we face at the moment is to really precisely quantify uh, where is this happening, uh, how much, and so on. Um, in parallel to that, we've also uh, used a similar uh, animal model, but in a rabbit at uh, user rep, where um, we basically, um, somehow just remodified a bit the technique uh, to enable uh, really this type of uh, 4D imaging. So where you, could, where you can really decouple the heart movement and the lung movement and have, have everything uh, uh, studied together. And here we could really study, uh, let's say the displacement and strain within the lung. So also here, the, um, uh, the, the model was a bit different, um, but it was also a Billy model, um, which was uh, in, in the, um, induced in the rabbits. And here, uh, the scan parameters were um, not so high resolution, so it was uh, 22 micrometer pixel size, but due to the, um, uh, to, um, let's say, higher uh, um, yeah, of flux available at synchrotrons, we could actually do this uh, in vivo and uh, very efficiently. <clears throat> So maybe to start here regarding the uh, in vivo Im um, imaging. So one of the challenges that we face also now when writing up uh, the, the study and so on is always how to quantify these changes in 3D. And I'll go to the next slide, but maybe just here to uh, show in lungs that uh, we want to essentially quantify some sort of nonlinear uh, changes. And essentially also what I was showing before, when you have a healthy lung and the lung deteriorates that um, uh, has some liquid inside, we are basically comparing uh, the same tissue, which doesn't look the same tissue at all. And that puts some challenges also in terms of uh, computation. So uh, what we developed earlier was really to do some sort of uh, thickness map analysis. So where we could uh, really analyze the uh, thickness of these uh, structures, but also what we want to look at is really the, um, uh, the surface between air and tissue and air and liquid and have some um, quantitative analysis with that as well. Um, now, why I say this is that um, based also on all the instrumentation that we had, we were then in fact able and uh, to, to image the whole um, uh, lung um, in a very short time. So this is like the whole acquisition here takes about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. And it's composed of 63 individual volumes and scans. And um, then we end up with a very high, uh, with a very big volume, which is uh, roughly one terabyte uh, in size. Um, that's also very similar to the uh, paper that um, uh, Martin was showing before from ESRF, where they image different organs. I always claim we were the first one to do it, <laughs> but um, the, the reason why actually we, we, we tried to exploit it was um, we wanted to mimic really uh, fresh conditions. So this is not an embedded sample. That's really an uh, animal that has been uh, sacrificed and is imaged right after there is no heartbeat anymore. So it's really kind of uh, similar in vivo conditions. 
And um, the reason why we made this scan time so short was just to be able uh, that the lung doesn't, um, let, let's say, change and so on. Still, there is some degradation process happening because there is uh, no blood flow anymore and so on. So basically, when we um, stitch the single volumes together, there is additional processing and deformation necessary on the computational side. Um, one thing also I mentioned here, I don't show anything, just, just to mention, so this thickness map analysis that I was showing before, applied to such a big sample without um, cropping it or scaling it, would take weeks of computation, but we also developed an algorithm to do it actually on a cluster in like 20 minutes or so. So that's uh, also a huge improvement, but actually what I want to say here is not that uh, we achieved it and now it's super great. I want to say that this is in essence possible with many of the analysis steps that are being done today. And I think we should uh, just realign to, to the fact that we will in the future be dealing with very big data sets and everything what we're doing today, uh, like in analyzing the data should also go into this direction. And we should also ask, okay, I want to do this on such a large data set, but in a, let's say foreseeable amount of time, not that they wait weeks or days to be calculated on a cluster. Um, here I just mentioned quickly also the work from uh, Karin's group, um, which uh, we started a couple of uh, years ago and they are uh, really returning uh, users in our facility to do uh, imaging. Um, yeah, it's just, um, um, it was also mentioned before, uh, standard paraffin blocks, uh, which are um, being scanned. Um, and yeah, I don't give more details because we have the experts uh, here. Um, now, I wanted to discuss actually this a little bit and I tried to mimic somehow what is actually the life cycle of such a typical synchrotron experiments and uh, who is doing actually what in this type of collaboration or um, yeah, experiment. And of course we have the user group who comes with their scientific questions with an idea of how to uh, realize an experiment and ideally then bringing insights to the scientific community. On the other hand, we have also the beamline stuff, which helps the user group somehow to evaluate the technical feasibility, but also uh, can act in helping to design the experiment and, of course, is the main help in the data acquisition process. So, um, of course, there are very uh, advanced user groups, which, for instance, have also ties to uh, synchrotron facilities, so they maybe don't need that much help from the beamline stuff. On the other hand, there are user groups who don't know anything how what the synchrotron does, what it can do, and need really significant help from uh, beam and stuff. And that's essentially also the way I understood the workshop today is to reevaluate this a bit, how to further um, advance this in the future. <laughs> and uh, one one thing is also so what's important here um, for the scientific questions to be placed and really work through. I put here one point, which, which I call just admin administration. And I just put it here to make understand. So going to synchrotron requires really personnel and staff uh, to do such an experiment. And it's not something where one puts a sample in and one gets a result out. And sometimes when I see new users, sometimes they, I, I don't know if they think or if they um, not realize what the whole setting is about um, to, to, um, to then realize, oh, I have so much data now, what should I do with it? And, uh, and I think that's something to keep in mind and to, uh, to think about how such a collaboration can, can work. And once this is set from the beginning on, I think then there is no problem. Another thing is that we rely more and more on data analysis experts to basically help with the data analysis, which essentially the user group may or may not have beamline staff may or may not have, and of course the interpretation which is together with the user group. Um, I highlight this here because if the data analysis becomes more and more challenging and there are more and more advanced algorithms that could be utilized to do the data analysis, it doesn't mean that they can be used by the beamline staff. On the other hand, it doesn't mean that the beamline staff or the user group knows about those. So for me, what is mostly what I want to somehow end with the discussion here is also to keep in mind that um, with synchrotrons, we really have access to, um, to huge data, to very high resolution data as was shown today. 
And this could actually also mean that we can have a different look at the data. We could use this data, for instance, just to image this type of organs and to work on modeling this data or to work on, let's say, simulations which were not possible to be done because this type of data was not available today. So one thing that um, we are currently trying, and that's also what uh, uh, somehow my role is also now in, in our Binan, is really to make this connection between data analysis and data acquisition to make this uh, much more prominent. And the, the, way, the, the reason I say it is that the classical, let's say synchrotron experiment was one comes with the data, takes the experiment, takes the data home and analyzes it. I think what we need to become better in is really bringing the sample in, scanning it, and having real-time feedback to see, OK, is this what I want to see? Or where do I want to scan? Do I want to have, a, a let's say, higher resolution in some places? And since we will have two beamlines in the future, I mean, it's also one thing to think about um, this multimodal imaging. Maybe one part of the scan is being done at one beamline and the other part at the other. And for this to, to work uh, essentially is also that uh, this connection between beamlines and data analysis experts uh, needs to be um, better pronounced. So that's and, and why I say it, it can be better or it needs to be better is simply that, uh, as I said, deploying some new algorithms in our architecture or infrastructure that we have in the lab is not straightforward today, but it could be. And on the other hand, for these experts to understand what are exactly our problems is also not straightforward nowadays, but it could be because they have the domain expertise in dealing with data. So uh, to conclude a bit and to, to just underline my personal kind of uh, outlook. Um, so we, we have achieved this high resolution in vivo um, imaging where we can uh, study different preclinical models. Um, as I said, so the uh, airway and alveolar structure was resolved down to a pixel size of three micrometers. And um, an interdisciplinary approach, as I was just showing on the previous slide, is really necessary to further develop uh, the techniques and the experimental design. And some of the topics now I, I kind of described in a very verbose way was really to have real-time imaging, to have real-time visualization post-processing at hand, and to enable for the future high field of view, high resolution imaging, and to go into the direction of low dose imaging, multi-region of interest imaging, multi-scale, or to have some sort of landmark driven imaging where uh, you come with a very specific, let's say, question of imaging a paraffin block or uh, whatever the sample is, or looking for features inside of the sample in an automated way. Uh, that's something that I think we, we can uh, start on working, uh, working on to provide this in a yeah, standard way. So that's, that's basically it. Yeah. Thanks a lot for structuring the talk that so smoothly opened the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, right now, questions for Goran. Yes, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, uh, it's an amazing job you've done with the scans. I'm just wondering, as Thanks. obviously we're uh, looking forward to the Max 4 uh, beam line, but uh, would you say that it's a it's a relatively close uh, close to live imaging to do the immediate post-mortem imaging that you showed? How fast does the, for instance, the lung as an example, how fast does the organ decay kick in? How, how you did 20 minutes, right, yeah. the scan, so how? you see the changes immediately or do you? Yeah, I mean, that's really just a very empirical. I, I don't know the exact the medical mechanism behind, but empirically what we always experienced was like half an hour where uh, you can really <clears throat> keep it stable and do the imaging. So that, that worked very well, yeah. I'm thinking just as an alternative, if there are no animal facilities close by and mm -hmm. you can uh, have some Yes, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. And one thing I cannot go, maybe you can go just one slide back. Um, I mean, uh, okay, ne never mind. I, I mean, one thing I wanted to highlight also is um, if you think about having things. Um, mm, so I, I was showing this arrow here, right, between data analysis and data acquisition. 
if you think uh, you are doing some sort of in vivo imaging and then you sacrifice the anim animal and do like such a scan in the end, um, I, I'm sure there is a way to feed in the data back to your uh, in vivo image and improve the image itself. That's actually something which we want to tackle, let's say for the future. But um, um, so I just say we have the data at hand, we just need to use it. So yeah. Hi, wonderful talk. So touching on this point between data acquisition and data analysis, do you, in your mind, do you think it's like a service that the synchrotron should offer them? <laughs> like a, a pre-packaged GitHub of this data analysis pipeline that the, the, the user could take with them and, or I mean, how? Yes, so uh, that's really my personal view. I think it should. And I think there is technical possibility to do so, but I don't see it being realized at any synchrotron so far. And um, and I, the, the way I see it, I think the synchro, in my opinion, the synchrotron should provide uh, clearly defined governance on how a user can bring uh, his or her um, algorithm to the synchrotron to use in parallel with the experiment that should be provided by a synchrotron facility that as i said that's just my personal view and the other thing uh, would be to provide let's say templates on how these things can be used so like a documentation where it's like a, a 10 minutes tutorial on how do i run this type of thing at, at lesson and i see this missing because we don't have tutorials for anything and not just we, I mean the, the synchrotron community, but that's something which then I'm able to say to a completely external user, look, this is the web page, go through it, work it through, and then uh, you will figure out what you will do at the experiment. That's something what I hope for the future to be able to provide, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.